Hello. Oh, let's turn on my camera. Where's my camera? Okay, I want to make it to my camera. Oh, you know what? Let me check real quick. Let me make sure that my uh, that the uh, the Wi-Fi because I see the Wi-Fi is not plugged in. So I just want to make sure that it continues to go. Tristan will not be showing us for the first episode because he is currently trying a case. Oh, all right. He, he may be back for the second one, so one second. Well, I, I sent him the invitation. If he gets uh, done, the invitation's in his email. Okay. Okay. People should go to Recording has been unpaused, and we are good to go. Okay, one second. It is good, buddy. Sorry. Seven. I feel like there was a burp in there, but maybe there's not. Okay. <clears throat> Knew it was there. <laughs> don't, don't doubt your gut. <laughs> yeah, I didn't like coming out before the show started. Okay. <clears throat> Ahoy, me hearties, and welcome once again to Full Stream Ahead. I'm your host, Charlie, the professor -esser. and with me as always is me skinny rich friend and first mate. It's Maz. Hey, Maz. Welcome once again to Full Stream Ahead. Tonight's episode, chapter 13, that's season two, episode five of The Mandalorian, The Jedi. The, Miland the, the, Malanda the Mandalorian travels to a world ruled by a ruthless magistrate who has made a powerful enemy. Director Dave Filani. Uh, writers this week are Dave Filani and Jean Favreau. Of course, we get our uh, created by credit for Jean Favreau. Oh, actually, uh, Dave Filani just gets that written by, created by Ghost of John Favreau. George Lucas, of course, is the based on Star Wars by. So the 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 softest working man in show business right now. <laughs> we love you, George Lucas, but let's face it. Right. <laughs> Although it, would have to be, it would have to be Dave Filoni doing everything this episode because Ahsoka is his character that he sort of shepherded to uh, into people's hearts, right? Well, yeah, yeah, in, and of course that cartoon. That is the thing that that is that is where I get you know that's where like I I do feel like for everyone that you know I don't know if you've ever seen the epic rap battle of history of Walt Disney versus Stan Lee. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. It's a fun one, but of course it ends with you know with them making peace. And then, of course, you know, there's no one that can mess with our legacies. And then you hear, M-I-C, I rock the mic properly, K-E-Y, <laughs> for profits I've got the key. And it's Disney. <laughs> and stacking, because he's the Disney landlord of stacking knots unstoppably. Uh, it is, it's a good epic rap battle and one that really, makes you go wow you know it's not like they're wrong you know it's not like it isn't an empire of joy and one of the reasons it is an empire of joy is because they understand that artists actually bring something to the table they actually 
you know, that you can't just let an artist go nuts, but you also can have to respect what an artist brings and, you know, can they bring what they bring? Are there an artist who can improvise? Are there an artist who can, who you can say, here are the rules, can you work with them? And, you know, a really good artist usually says, sure, you know? I mean, Maz, you know, you've done improv. You know, when you've got, like, what, give me a location, a career, and a venereal disease. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, like he handled uh, the character of Ahsoka from, you know, when she was a child or on the cartoon, and she's quite rather unlikable, and then gave her this arc, and he, so it's like, I'm sure he has a, a special place in, in his heart yeah, for that character, and wanted it to be presented properly, so I, I'm glad, it, I, I'm, and it, obviously, it was all going to be him this episode. Yeah, and, and it is well done, and Ashoka is, Ashoka really Ashoka, shines in this. Right? The H yeah, uh, comes before yeah. the S. Um, well, yeah, um, Gina, I, I got me uh, questioning so. my, my Star Wars pronunciations. Yeah, because um, I, I went through the same thing. I, I was like, let me just look it up. And I looked up and I was like, oh, because I heard so many people yeah. say, it. I was like, I was getting it wrong. I was like, the H comes before the S. That's what yeah, we're throwing. It is off. Ahsoka. It is yeah. Ahsoka. Ta but it might be one of those things where it's Ahsoka, but it's also pronounced Ashoka. I haven't heard anyone say it that way, though. Okay. I'm um, a show or, you know, aside okay, from myself. So it's a, I, it, it's Ahsoka I thought time. I was the only one. <laughs> no. So, yeah. So she, she, but that is, this is, for those who don't know, hmm. this is um, Anakin's uh, Padawan. Um, right. which, which is interesting and this is what I, one of the things I think is most interesting because I don't know if you've seen the final episode yet of mm -hmm. this season just, just, just did yes I think that entire and we're not going to say what it was but that entire after credit, after, after credit scene that is lifted directly mm. from a legend story okay like what that says and I there is this quality, which makes me wonder, are we eventually going to see Starkiller at some point? What's um, <clears throat> that's Darth Vader's apprentice. Oh. You know, I'm, I mean, you know, there's all sorts of things out there in the legends that, you know, everyone got mad because, oh, Disney says the legends aren't canon anymore. It's like, well, the legends were never canon. <laughs> <clears throat> they're just something that exists to be explored. But anyway, in this moment, what we have is um, uh, Ahsoka Tano um, as, at this point, as far as anyone knows, The Last Jedi. Because... Is it because in, she says there aren't very many left, so I, it just makes it sound like there's a smattering of them somewhere, but they're even more hidden than The Mandalorians. <laughs> Well, yeah, exactly, exactly, you know. Um, and they would rather have you believe that there is only one Mandalorian. Exactly. They would be more than happy to let you think there is one Mandalorian. Um, and in this episode, we have uh, Ahsoka Tan is basically waging a one-woman war against the magistrate of this planet who is uh now the magistrate represents yes the new uh no well, so that is or... apparently a care i believe her character is uh morgan elspeth is a character it's played by i want to say it's by the anna lee in a santo mm-hmm because there's like five people that are listed on MDB for this. So by process of elimination, she's not the prisoner, village boy, village girl, or governor wing, or the villager. So I'm guessing uh, that's Morgan Elspeth. Uh, Lang, of course, is Michael Bean, who, uh, well, we know how his story ends. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Morgan Elspeth is interesting because she... And apparently what this, this is, you know how, how well, I mean, you don't know, I always say this, but like there have to be these corporations that are just building these Star Destroyers, that are building these droids, you know, that they have, an, that they have designations like T-911 that is a model number 
not like a personal name. Like R2D2 isn't even like that droid's designate, designation per se. It's just what they call it. BB-8 isn't its designation. It's like the model number. It's like, you know, a 57 Chevy, you uh -huh. know? You know, you have your make and your model. And I get the feeling a lot of droids are the same way. So this woman, Morgan Elspeth, is one of these people who was basically the ironmonger for the Empire. And has basically, you know, depleted her planet's resources in service to the Empire because, you know, it makes her a petty dictator. No, I was just trying to figure out if they were the old oppressors or the new oppressors. So it's the old oppressors. Yeah, as nearly as I can. Well, and although it's sort of one of these, it's one of these things where, you know, they built the weapons for the Republic, and now they build them for the Empire. It's sort of like when you realize, huh. when the one character was talking about how he was a slave in the genetic pits for four of your human lifetimes, you realize the Empire hasn't been around for four human lifetimes. You know, that, that was originally a Republic genetic pit that this person was working in. That all of these things were part of what the Republic was. Maybe they're just a part of, you know, the nature of sentient beings. Well, I mean, arguably, that's, that's maybe that's the thing. Is that What it is, is that in, under the Republic, you had people that were happy to devalue human life or even non-human, or to be more specific, happy to devalue non-humanoid life. Mm. Um, and, or non-settler life, you know, not for nothing, you do see that there is a real, there's a common theme among people that we see in both the Rebellion and the Empire. You know, it, you know the, the huts are the exception, not the rule in the power structures should be telling to people and in that structure yeah so they come to the planet they use their superior technology to to take what they can from the planet and that if it's for the glory of the republic and you know we're going to have our we're going to have our dem, we're going to have our republican democracy and rights and freedoms for all um, or it's going to be for the oppression of the empire, it's kind of six of one, half a dozen at the end of the day. And so these, these were the beings who, and they did come up in the previous uh, Clone Wars story. Um, and in the end, they actually make the choice, as I understand it, to, to basically s side with... Uh, I believe it's at the end of this, we get Admiral Thrawn mm. called out in this. Um, was it at the end of this one or was it at the end of the last one? Because um, uh, what's her name is looking for Thrawn? No, uh, what's her name is looking for? Um, Gideon, uh, Moff Gideon. Yeah, Moff Gideon. Thrawn is who Ashoka is looking for. Because uh, okay. you also have to remember that Thrawn is from the Clone Wars. Right, um, right. No, no, actually, no, yeah. is from Rebels. Because Ahsoka actually gets thrown forward in time. Oh. And that's how she becomes enwrapped. So after the Clone Wars, Ahsoka gets thrown forward in time. And that causes her to become enwrapped in the Rebellion and has this fight with... Uh, Admiral Thrawn, I, b I believe, and I'm not like 100% versed on all of these things, but, or maybe it was that at the end of, anyway, but Thrawn was like out in the outer edges of the galaxy, mapping everything coming back. So we're going to see Thrawn in the future shows. We're going to be, and that's, that's the big reveals in all of these things, is we're going to be getting all of this deep canon throughout this galaxy. And, you know, that's, that's the glory of the end of the Star, Star Skywalker story is that now we can really talk about everybody else in the galaxy. Hmm. Hmm. And Ashoka is, Ashoka is just one story here. Um, because, and I do, love, I do love this because the Mandalorian is brought into the city 
And again, it's always weird to me that you, like it's it's one, it's an entire planet, but it's ruled from this one walled city. <laughs> you know, because the rest of it is untended and untamed, right? Yeah, for the most, or maybe it's not. Maybe like over on the other side, they're like, "Wait, what's going on over there? Who's doing yeah. that?" It's interesting that there's so many dimensions and pockets of narratives that are happening, maybe independent of each other, not even aware that the other <laughs> is is practicing. Well, you know, that's what I always tell people about. Like, if you want to, if you ever want to do like a good storytelling game, like Vampire or Werewolf, you can have whatever your plot is. Don't expect the characters to follow it. But just remember, whatever that plot is, is still going on. So if the bomb goes off at midnight, then it still goes off at midnight, even if our characters had no interest in finding out what it was about. Right. And hopefully they're far enough away from wherever you planted the bomb that it's like, oh, man, wow, I wonder why that building blew up. I don't know. <laughs> is something? Yeah. Well, definitely missed something. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, but that's that's the glory of the new Star Wars. That's the glory of what Disney has decided to do with this franchise. You know, and I think that's sort of what I think Star Trek wants to do over on their side with their different stories. But I think that they keep on getting stuck into this fact that they want to stay true to this idea of the Federation instead of just, you know, exploring what's going on in a, on a Frankie merchant vessel, you know? Hmm. What's that story? What's that plan? What's that ship's adventures? You know, because everybody has adventures. You know, and honestly, right. I, I would love to know the Merchant Marine stories of Frankenar. Uh, but yeah, that's I wonder, a whole other thing. I wonder if there's like you know, like um, teams or shows that are popular with the Ferengis that have the Ferengis in their own version of when they first explored the cosmos. You know, well, what was that a, journey like? You know, you know, Maz, it's. I'm glad you asked because actually, if that actually there is canon because there's an action figure line. What? There's an action figure line about the great, you know, ship. I forget what his name is, but basically, Quark had the original, had his originals, but he took them out of the box so they lost their value. They still have value, but you know, it's like you know right. when when Moogie gives him his old toy back, he's like, yes, you know, my, my you know, that's my Quark, great. My corporate raider sag, you know, it's like, you know. That's awesome. You know, <laughs> with punching action, yeah. Mm. It's, you know, but that's the idea. Yeah. Imagine, imagine if in their version of this show, the Ferengis look like Ferengis, but their versions of human might be wildly too imaginative, right? Like human. You know, you know what humans, look, but you know, they'd be like very stereotypical humans, you know. They'd probably, you know, like, you know Ferengi eyes them. Like we humanize things, they would probably Ferengi eyes. Like their humans would probably look human, but they would still have the, you know, the the folds or or, or whatever, you know. They have very tiny ears, mm. or maybe oversized ears for what humans think of. Like that, that right. would be it. like right. They have huge human ears, but they're human ears. Right, 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 right. You don't want them to say that they all have <laughs> tiny lobes, you know. <laughs> so you want to give, but they've got that, those big flappy ears that don't connect to your brow. How are you going to hold your ears in place? They're flapping all around like that. Yeah, that's a really good idea for some strange, like out of the box fan fiction that maybe hasn't been written before. Yeah. Writing from the perspective of other species in this um, world. Yeah. Anyway, getting back to this story. Right. So, so Mando knows that this is where Ahsoka Tano is. And he knows that that's a Jedi, and he needs to give the child to a Jedi. But also within this, we also get this real connection between, um, uh, uh, I believe it's uh, Pe Pedro Pascal's character. I want to say it's uh, Darren Jin. Din Djarin. Din Djarin. Din Djarin. Um, had, it, had it right, but reversed it. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, because everyone calls him the man, calls him Mando or the Mandalorian. Right. So they, they have real trouble with sticking to names that people like in this show. Yeah, it's, it's, but anyway, that, that's, you know, well, what it is is because I actually think it's kind of offensive to call him that. Call it's him like, what? To call him the Mandalorian, you know. Oh, how come? 
Well, because he's that, that is who he is. Well, well, actually, to call him Mando. So I guess when we call him the Mandalorian, because of course he's not the Mandalorian, he's a but, Mandalorian. But isn't there only a Mandalorian? Isn't that the whole point? We are Mandalorian, we're not individuals. Yeah. This is like, you know, so I don't know. Yeah. But, like, I can, this is where we start to see that he wants to be more than that, right? No, I mean, he's just been told that it's possible. He's just yeah. been like, you know, everybody needs a justification for doing something. He's just been given that. And maybe he didn't, you know, like latch onto it or it didn't resonate with him right then, but it's slowly coming to term. And he's like, wait a second, you know what? Maybe it means more to be a Mandalorian than what I've been told. Maybe I don't have the full story. Maybe the full story has been kept from me. Maybe it's possible to honor this code, honor this, this oath, or honor this responsibility that I have in a way that still affords me other opportunities. Well, exactly, and that's sort of what we're building towards. And um, when Ahsoka, so, and this is one of the things I love in this, this is when he first meets Elspeth, and she like says, "We will, I'll give you the Spear of Beskar if you uh, capture the Mandalorian. Or, or capture, capture the, 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 the Jedi. Jedi. Right. And he never says he'll do it. Right. He right, actually right. is very cautious in what he says. He says, hmm, okay. Right, but at the same time, I'm glad that he's not so hung up on, on the code or whatever to not get the job done. If, it, like, yeah. if I say, okay, you can take that however you want to, and, and I'm okay with you interpreting that however you want to, but technically I didn't say it, but I'm glad he still has you know, tact enough yeah. to not be so tied down to – I can't say something I won't do. Kind of like, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. But it's it's great how it is. And then he goes and he meets her, and of course she has this whole. Conf- this is where we learn his name is Grogu. My, 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 my favorite thing though is like when the fight first breaks out, and he has to be like, "Yo, yo, Bo-Katan sent me. Bo-Katan sent me." You know, it, it, it was like a hairy situation. Well, yeah, because she is a Jedi, you know? Yeah. I mean, they are really good at what they do because – so it's actually an interesting thing when you think about it, when you come to this idea about being tied to the Force and the Force being in all living things. And it gives you this idea that when you are dealing with things, you know, you can read them in a way that is preternatural, you know? So – a Jedi fighting against the living opponent knows the move you're going to make before you know what the move you're going to make is. It's like they're seeing your move two steps ahead of you. Because they're seeing it in the dimensionality of the Force and they can feel the movement or of the field that you exactly. don't know that you're generating. And they can sort of instinctively yeah. or with whatever organ or, or substance they're able to feel that with, they can feel your movement in that, um, what's the word for yeah. seeing the future kind of way. Yeah, which is always one of those things about, like, you know, they actually should, Jedi should actually technically be very weak against droids, but I guess droid technology just has never advanced enough. But they have lightsabers, so it's like, you know. Well, yeah, and lightsabers really are really, uh, uh, like, you know, honestly, heavier than blasters. That's what's interesting about lightsabers. Although, as we see, um... Best car can hold its own against the lightsaber. Yeah. Yeah. You know. although, although, I mean, let's not jump ahead to the final episode just because I just saw it, but there's some very interesting questions raised about the strength of Best car versus other things and how lightsabers well, yeah. are some things and don't. Yeah. But, and okay. yes. What's important to remember about that is that's not technically a lightsaber. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Oh, that makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah, there's... All right, all right, all right. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'll yeah, leave it at that. that. We won't get into that, but that actually, that actually goes into this whole thing. There actually is an interesting plotline within Rebels, mm-hmm. which I don't even know how it actually found, wound up being resolved, because I only half watched Rebels when it's on, but basically there is a Mandalorian engineer among the, the the main characters and one of the things that she's trying to design is oh wouldn't it be great if we could have a blaster that could burn through beskar i mean at some point it's simply about getting the math right right exactly well that's the argument and so the, that is sort of the that is sort of the the idea in this too so but we won't get into that we'll talk about that later and 
actually me and Tristan had a whole conversation about that, about what's happening in that scene in the final episode. But you right. have to wait oh, three yeah, yeah. more episodes so to, to get to, to that. Just to, go, just to go back on, on, on to the, uh, the lightsaber versus Beskar argument. Maybe, you know, it's impossible to make the math work because since blasters and all that are using lasers, which is just light, if something has found the math around the problem of the speed of light, maybe lasers can never penetrate Beskar because there's some sort of relationship there uh, having to do with how fast light can go versus how compact the molecules of Beskar might be or something, you know. Yeah, well, actually, one thing I, would, I was actually going to go into is this, this idea of the, the force in and of itself is maybe even, if it is tied to all living things, then maybe when something is inorganic, that gives it a weird... Power over it. Like I said, you know, the one thing that I say, you, know, you never see someone do a Jedi mind trick on a on a droid. Now, granted, maybe you don't have to, but then again, they have droids that are there to kill you. You know, and it's that was always that thing. I always felt like that was the reason why in the prequels they're using droids mm. because you can't Jedi mind trick a droid. Mm. The droid only sees the inorganic, and so when you try to, you you can crush a droid and you can push a droid, because you know the rest of the universe is alive and you can manipulate its physical body. But you, you can't, can't mesmerize it. Yeah, you can't say, "I'm not the Jedi you're looking for." Like, no, you're clearly the Jedi I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> you, I answered the code written by my creator. Yeah, it's like I, I, get, I have facial recognition software. You are clearly Obi Wan Kenobi. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, so it's, it's so it's interesting that she's she's super super strong, and he is able to get her to understand. Hey, I have a message, and then she's immediately like, "Oh, I hope you're here to talk about that little guy." Well, yeah, because she knows that's a tridactyl. And, 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 and I'm surprised that she didn't feel the presence of such a, I guess, powerful being around if she can indeed feel the vibrations of the well, force. Well, you know, but the thing is, is that, and this is the thing, it, it is this idea, it's an idea, it's an idea that Matt Pat put out there, which is that, you know, in a planet with more life, oh, uh, like if you're in a swampy area, that's going to be much more charged with the force, right? Than a place like Hoth, which is frozen over and probably has much less of the force. So it's a lot less noise. Exactly. So in that situation, it's like that. He is strong in the force. Isn't something she's going to necessarily feel. She's going and to feel that. We sort of get the sense that. Sorry, and we also sort of get the sense that he's sort of shy about using it, unless he has to. Well, yeah, because and, and when, because he, the backstory we get that he's been sort of like you know like a dog kept in a in, in a in a bad place. They get really reserved and don't want to you know do anything to cause them to invite uh, harm or violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's been holding back. Exactly, he's been holding back, and um, although we see that when it's something he wants, like the little ball, he's still a child. Like, he can't help it. To a certain measure. Yeah. That is not, he doesn't want to lift rocks, but if you show him the little ball, he's like, I'll take the ball. Thank you. <laughs> or um, macaroons. Or macaroons or whatever. If I want it, I'll take it. You yeah. know? Yeah. I'm, still, I'm still a baby Yoda. So um, that's, and that's a nice aspect of the story, I think. Yeah. Um, and we do get in this that Ashoka Tan, uh, uh, um, Ahsoka Tano, senses in you know, in 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 grogu much fear and we also get in this this basic statement which is like yeah i know he has much fear he's had a hard life you're the jedi who's supposed to help him which is also just this idea that you know no i have to do this thing in this battle and this is my question it's like dude it's a kid. and for what it's worth this is mando saying you know dude it's a kid you, this is your people. You are Jedi. Right. This is Jedi. You're supposed to, especially when he says, she says, oh yes, he actually trained at the temple. But he was taken out, and clearly he was taken out before 
all the younglings were slaughtered. Although, as my headcanon is, not as many younglings got slaughtered as you thought, because those 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 ten year old younglings just ju- just rushed him, and <laughs> mm. he did not kill as many as we think. He's like he killed a few. Don't get me wrong; I'm sure he killed a number of them because he likes to kill women and children. Yeah. But there were a few that got there. They, they kicked him in the nards because he still oh. had nards then. Yeah, so, yes. So, um, yeah, they were not unformidable. Yes, and Grogu, but Grogu was was spirited away before then. Hmm. Um, and it also raises that question: if like he is like was born in the Jedi Temple, that is he like is he like the Dalai Lama of the Jedi? I've often said that maybe he is the actual chosen one. Because someone pointed out that he actually would have been born at the same time as Anakin. Mm. You know, so we've been just following the Neville Longbottom story this whole time, and it is actually uh, Grogu who is the chosen one. It's a possibility. I don't know. But um, but it is interesting that she does give that same line about him, but I'm sensing fear. And at that same time, you also get the sense that for Mando, he's not 100% disappointed by it. He's mm. mad because he's been chasing it, but he also, you can really start to see that he has this attachment to Grogu. Right. That is super deep. And building. Yeah. Um, so he agrees. And also because like, he's, he's lost everything. All his people, all his little, you know, little coven of Mandalorians are broken apart. He has nothing. He has no mm-hmm. one. And through his allegiance to his sense of duty, he has been forced into this this situation where you know he uh, he's around the child consistently. So it's like he he can't help but form a relationship as much as he doesn't want to. Like it's there. It's like now he's like, oh, well, how did I get here? But like we're definitely here, you know? Yeah, and for what it's worth, it 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 is that idea that you know he is with this kid and this kid has been a part of his story for so long and he has a dedication he has a dedication to him as a foundling Mm. and i think that's really what it is that he's a foundling this is his foundling but he also he can't train him to be a mandalore (laughs) you know because he's too young for that and he's too powerful oh i you know that's the thing i don't know that he is interesting well or to put it more more precisely, I think Mandalorians are pretty powerful. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, I, I think that a, a force, and to be fair, like that dark saber that we've seen, canonically, that is the saber that was wielded by the Mandalorian Jedi. So there was a Mandalorian who became a Jedi, and his saber was the dark saber. Mm. And just that idea that you know you could be a Mandalorian and a Jedi that is a thing and I hope we revisit Grogu at some point I I hope we revisit the Mandalorian at some point you know um spoilers for the end of the series nobody's dead yet Uh, (laughs) among those two Grogu and Mandalorian and the Mandalorian both make it to the end of this this season I mean I, I would like to think so yeah, so don't worry. By the end of the season, neither Grogu has been murdered horribly. I'm sorry that ruins the series for you. Because uh, <laughs> honestly, there were a couple moments where I was like, oh my gosh, they're not going to do that. Are they? Like, no, they didn't do that. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, like it would be a very different show if, if they did something like yes. this. You can't expect and the same with And the same with, um, with, with Jin Darden. Um, you know, they're not going to have him you know, do give the ultimate sacrifice, which right. honestly, you don't know that's going to happen. tried to several times already, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, to be fair. I mean, you know, he is... He's been completely comfortable with making that decision several times. Yes. Um, but as it is, he decides not to. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, 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 Soka Tan, Tano and... Um, uh, Jindaran decide to they're going to go overthrow this city because basically you know the Mando is like um, you know uh, 
sure, I'll help you overthrow her. Can you get this kid to a Jedi? And she's like, well, I won't train him, but tell you what, I'll, 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 we'll figure it out if you can help me overthrow this. Which is also goes to show her a little bit of her own duplicitousness because she still has no interest in training him. Right, and, and I think she sort of understands that she's not at the level that can handle you know, when, when, when you're trying to, like, uh, form something into uh, and funnel its energies into something productive, are you good enough to be able to take that energy and not let it waste here and here and be able to funnel it into something useful? She doesn't think that she possesses those skills because he's really powerful and he's really afraid. And those are emotions that, you know, something really, someone le really learned would have to learn how to cope with and to deal with to be able to mold in the direction that you want to. And she's scared of that. Yeah, and for what it's worth, as Sokotano did eventually meet Darth Vader, and so she and recognized him. As oh, Anakin. oh, oh, right, right, right. So right, she right. knows that whole, you know, I sent you much fear, mm. and I actually know how that much fear ends up. You know, as Yoda said to young Anakin, you know, I sense in you much fear. But uh, they do agree to basically they're going to take down Elspeth. Uh, and they go, they go do their siege of the city, which, you know, goes about as well as you'd think it would when you have a Jedi and a Mandalorian. I mean, yeah. It, 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 it's fun, and I love the... Um, we do get a couple of neat points in this uh, because we do get to basically the big boss girl showdown between... Um, I'm sorry, boss woman showdown between Elspeth and... Uh, uh, Ahsoka Tano uh, and then you have uh, Elspeth's right hand uh, played by Michael Bean, um, uh going by the name Lang basically saying hey sounds like our bosses are fighting <laughs> I guess I guess whoever wins that's you know whoever wins uh, that tells how you and I are going to figure this out you know Yeah, yeah and it's neat because you can see him just totally, and for a moment there, you're like thinking, hey, he, he's he's totally a merc. He's like, hey, I got no dog on this fight. I, you know, I'm here cause I'm here for the paycheck, you know, three hots and a cat, man. That's what I work for. I'm yeah. not going to go kill you over this. But then he tries to turn on it, man. Well, he, I mean, because if you can get the gold and get away with it, why wouldn't you? And that's the kind of person he is, too. Well, yeah, but, you know, I think that the guy who's always looking to get the gold and get away with it is the guy who's never going to get the gold. That's true. <laughs> it's like, you know, oh, what if I, what if I double cross this person? Right, right. Just you could have got away with maybe not the gold, but with your life. Exactly. It's like, and, you know, not for nothing. Maybe if you make a friend, maybe you'll get the gold in the yeah, end. Because yeah. clearly this guy's not interested in the gold. You know, he's interested in maybe some Beskar or maybe something else, but he's got his own agenda. Yeah. So. He's like, hey, listen, man, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep fighting you until I'm getting paid to fight for you. Uh, when there's no one to sign that check, uh, my duty ends. So, you know. Exactly. But uh, he blows that and then he gets shot. So. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they make the one random villager, which is also kind of, I don't know, I, I don't quite know how to take that. <laughs> Just sort of like, oh, you were the guy who talked to me that one time, you'll be in charge. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like, okay. <laughs> um, well, I, uh, you're always looking for someone to, to, to decide, right? So you don't have to be responsible for it. Yeah, well, it, 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 I mean, obviously, and it, I think there's the implication that this guy was like maybe the governor before Elizabeth showed up, mm -hmm. that he was this person who was respected by the community, yada, yada, yada. Although at the same time, I'm also kind of thinking that, I don't know if you ever saw um, like the last episode of the regular series of Recess before they moved to the fourth grade. Oh, yeah. yeah, but there's this whole thing where like King Bob is graduating, so he just grabs a random... <laughs> Lower classman and puts the crown on him, and he's just this kid sitting there with the crown in his head. So uh, that's funny. That's just something that that strikes me in that moment. But um, I I'm an adult who watches a lot of cartoons. There's nothing creepy about it. No, um, I wish I could watch more cartoons. Yeah, well, you know, they they're on demand now, man. You can watch them whenever yeah. you want. That's the thing. Um, 
Anyway, so they do defeat uh, Elspeth and her gang, and that's pretty much it, you know? Um, we find out that... Um, that yeah. Ahsoka can, can show him to a, uh, a Jedi phone book. Yeah, basically, there's a very powerful Jedi temple, which is always one of those weird things. It, it, it was funny to me because I just watched the Lego holiday special of Star Wars, <laughs> where they also go to the Jedi temple that has the gateways to all the times and spaces you want to go to. Like, oh. They just leave these Jedi temples lying around like, you know, and, and, and at the edge of, uh, at the edge Or of none of their enemies think, hey, let's destroy their communication network. You know, usually that's one of the first things the military thinks about. Let's destroy their communication network. But no, they're like, not, I guess what's weird about it is that it's not really a communication network. Well, it's just like, it's just basically a power node huh. of the I force. Mean, and it's like you could, if you demolish the temple, you would lose the marker, but the oh. actual force power would still be there. I guess is the argument. Right, right. So even if you wanted to use the force for bad, it would be helpful to know where the mm -hmm. power code is. I got you. That makes and sense. To be fair, both Darth Vader and Palpatine use the force. So. Yes, indeed, and and that's is sort of sort of what they're trying to do with Old Grogu, also. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that is a whole what exactly what they're trying to do with Grogu is still a mystery. Yeah. Um, but it is interesting and you know, what he and his M count can do. But anyway, we'll get to that later. <laughs> right now we have defeated it. So yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Um Ahsoka Tan tells him, you know, take him to this this place. Uh he can reach out with a force. If someone wants to train him, they'll find him. You know, not, not even to train him, but like if someone feels a vibration that powerful in the forest, they should know that it's an important enough asset to take hold of. Because if that gets passed to the other side, that could be dangerous. Well, if there I, are Jedi's out there that still care about that sort of thing, because I don't know if they're that broken up that they're like ah. Well, I think there's this other aspect to it, which is because when uh, Ahsoka Tano is dealing with Grogu, she makes the explicit point, he doesn't want to come with me, he wants to stay with you. Mm. You know, it's like, you know, I could, even if I wanted to take him, which I don't, because, you know, I'm... I'm 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 a career lady. Sorry, I don't have time. And also that, but if they can read their each other's minds, Grogu probably already sensed the reluctance to take him on, and was not pre probably didn't feel all warm and fuzzy about it. Yeah, and for, let's let's be honest here. The reason why Anakin went to the dark side was because you know Obi Wan had no interest in training a Padawan. Mm -hmm. um, you never want to be in that bad relationship kind of mentor state that that's what that's what that's about so uh so yeah so but that's where it ends um Matt, uh jin darden gets his spear of beskar which is an awesome weapon indeed uh, really it is and uh bad guys defeated and now we have to go to the jedi temple next episode any final thoughts on tonight's episode, uh, Mozzie? Um, I thought that that moment was was interesting with uh, with um, Ahsoka. To, also, the way they handled Ahsoka's whatever it is, hair, facial, whatever thing, it was interesting because from, from seeing the cartoon, you like, how are they going to handle that? Is it going to look okay? Is it going to look hokey? Is it going to move in weird ways when she moves? But they pulled it off really well. It, it yeah. looked like it belonged there. It didn't seem out of place. It felt like a part of her. Um, and her acting was, was really, really great. Because in those moments where she's sitting there and telepathically communicating with Grogu, like, she's such a phenomenal actress. You literally saw, like, different things happening and she her reacting to different things. It was, it was really, really nicely done. I thought she did a really good job. And they did a really good job with her prosthetics. Um, yeah. But when she says, uh, you know, uh, maybe can you get him to do it? Maybe he'll listen to you and he's like, well, that'll be the first. But then without even realizing it, he knows exactly the language that he speaks. It's this little ball thing. So 
Uh, I, I thought that moment was really, really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, Rosario Dawson is great. Um, she's getting her own series. There's going to be an Ahsoka Tan series. Uh, Ahsoka Tano uh, series. So it's set in this universe of the, I imagine, the post- the, the the post New Republic era, you know, um, or the pre New Republic or the New Republic era, and that is going to be an interesting thing because it's a universe that has never been explored. You know, when you think about it, it's like you get the the explosion of the second Death Star, the fall of the Empire, the Emperor is gone. You have all these things in that moment, but then we and then when we get to the the prequel or the sorry the sequels you know uh um seven eight nine you know there there is a republic there is a thing but at the same time clearly all of these there's gangster worlds and gambling worlds and there's all these little outer rim stories that are still happening in that universe so you know there's a lot to be told in this world so I'm yeah. excited for that, and we'll see what Ahsoka Tan uh, uh, does with that. So this was a great backdoor pilot, wow. which didn't feel like a backdoor pilot. That's yeah. what I love about it. It was a backdoor. It was clearly a backdoor pilot, but it doesn't feel like a backdoor pilot because it is part of this central story. It moves the story forward. You know, like I said, the the folks creating this really know how to tell stories. And you have to appreciate that just in and of itself. So uh, I'm excited about it. Um, Indeed. Hey, hey, Maz, uh, are you hearing me okay? What's that? Are you hearing me? See, that's the problem, ah. Maz. I see you're not even wearing headphones. Ah. You know, you got to get yourself some high quality tweaked audio headphones by going to tweakedaudio.com and use the coupon code Southgate to get a discount on your purchase. Um, after that, you know what you can use that same coupon code Southgate for? Uh, some Hunter Killer over at HunterKiller.com. You know, Michelle Gray solve a cold case. It's like getting a escape room delivered to your house, which is kind of cool. You know, and this time we can't leave the house, go get an escape room delivered. It'll be fun. Um, additionally, if that doesn't interest you, uh, we have a whole gift guide for whatever you might be interested in and i'm going to be honest with you by the time this episode airs it's probably well past christmas but you know what there are birthdays there are sweetest days valentine's day is coming up and you have a person you love and you need a gift to get them go check out the gift guide for south for the southgate media group crew over at uh as well as the capes and lunatics gift guide uh it's all in the show notes. Phil takes care of that part. Well, uh, speaking, of, speaking of that, like, okay, so when this airs, it'll definitely, 2020 will be behind us. Do you want to send, like, so. a 2020 version of yourself a message from 2021? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I have no idea. What I will say right now is I believe, like, I believe today episode one dropped. Mm-hmm of uh our our our, our and, and and clearly we have but maybe two weeks left in this year so yeah it will most definitely be a message to the past charlie from 2020 yes so there so, you go what i want to say to 2020 charlie oh 2020 charlie um i hope it all worked out okay uh <laughs> 2021 charlie i hope I, I hope you hear this i hope you're alive i hope <laughs> No, no, no. Oh, this we is... made it to the future. No, 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 Charlie. You don't understand. Right now, you're the 2021 Charlie talking back to the Charlie that's going to exist. That exists now, but but hypothetically in this world that we're creating. Because 2020 Charlie is going to perceive this in 2021, right? Yeah, but I'm still 2020 Charlie. Right, right. No, so, so it would be the other round. I, I had it backwards. So this exactly. is... You're talking to the 2021 Charlie. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. right now it's like me in the future. Who knows what I'm doing? Right, I hope right, things right. are good. That's what I, that's all I can say. You know, I hope apple juice is still plentiful in the future. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Let me get my apple juice as well. Okay. Yes, indeed. I, I, I'll toast to that. Sure. Lachaim. Lachaim. Anyway, um, so you've gone down the show notes. You've bought everything you wanted on Amazon. Uh, along those lines, you know, there's that book uh, podcast. 
Pod Life, Pod Life the book, uh, written by the Southgate Media Group family. Um, read it. You might like it. It's about podcasting. And you clearly like podcasting because you heard it on a podcast. And if any of that stuff is interesting, uh, you can uh, talk to us here. Uh, Maz, how could they find you? Or oh, they can email me at mazmanzor at gmail.com or find me on Facebook under Maz Manzor. That's M O Z M A N Z O R. And of course, you can always write to me in that old fashioned email way that we are Maz and Paz once did at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word at gmail.com. Of course, follow me on the Twitter site live tweet. Uh, DuckTales, a woohoo, which is the final season. So I don't know how many episodes are left by the time this airs. Um, but, you know, I will be, the, the, right now they're on hiatus during the Christmas season when we're recording this. So maybe they're back by now. So check me out at Charlie Esser. That's C H A R L I E S S E R. Look for the two E's in the middle. For quality. Bing. <laughs> Thank you, Maz. All right. All right, me hearties. It has been another evening on the torrid seas of podcastery. I hope you have not been cast too far so that you can come back again next week as we once again sail full stream ahead. <laughs> right on. Okay. So we'll stop All this. All right. You can send me the link to the other. By the yes. way, um, if you could, when you email these to me, email Phil2 mm -hmm. at uh, capesandlunatics, dot, uh, capesandlunatics at gmail.com. So that, because I think, because I've been having trouble uploading them, but I think he can download them. Oh, yeah, because, yeah, it'll be easier if he just downloads it directly. You don't have to go through three parties. Yeah, yeah I dig it. Right on. So no, but CC me so that I know that it's there. So that you know we can we can work it out between us but yeah okay i don't cool, all man. right so let me hang up this one and uh i just gotta go feed the dog and then uh i'll yep. start the new one i've gotta go see a man about a horse too so <laughs> no problem